You are looking at the largest largemouth bass taken in the state of Michigan last year in 1981, an eight and a half pounder. You want to know how to catch it? Well, you got to talk to the guy who caught it. 12-year-old Donnie Anderson from Rosebush. He'll tell you all about it in just a minute because it's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again at all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. Donnie, thousands and thousands of bass fishermen in the state fish long and hard to catch maybe a four or five pounder and they go home and brag about it. You have an eight and a half pounder here. You're a real master angler, aren't you? Not real talking right this minute, but we got to start talking right now, Donnie, because we got to find out how you caught it. How'd you do it? Well, we were bluegill fishing and I got tired of bluegill fishing and I asked my grandpa if I could see if I could catch anything else. So he put them in and I threw it out there with my barber and about, I don't know, two minutes later, the barber just went straight down. And my grandpa said, fight it. And um, we were fighting it and didn't know what it was until we got it up to the boat because he, it flipped once, but it was pretty far away. And got up to the boat, and my grandpa, my dad, netted it and brought it up. And well, how long did that take you to fight it? A long time out, about an hour. About an hour? Seemed like hours and hours. Well, this is the rig that you used, a treble hook with a wire leader and a bobber looks like pike bait. Ned Fogel, the urban recreation fishery specialist for the DNR. This isn't the way you're supposed to catch bass. I mean, they're supposed to be so wary that a wire leader will scare them off a mile away. Obviously, some of them are. He did pretty good with this one. Well, what's, what was the secret to his success? Why did he catch a bass like this? You were fishing, first of all, where? Canadian Lakes. Canadian Lakes, okay, on the map here. Go back, that's right up just north of Mount Pleasant in this area of the state, uh, a private lake which you have some property on, and you were fishing in how deep of water? Mm. It was about 12 foot in reefs, but I was on the hook about six feet. So you were six feet down and 12 feet of water off the weeds. Well, the bass, bass are supposed to be in the deep water. At, he caught this in August, August 6th. They're supposed to be out in the deep holes, Ned. Not necessarily. With the vegetation on that, why well, you'll find the bass in these areas, and obviously with the minnow, he was able to get right down where the fish was laying and as he's cruised along. And, and uh, a lot of fishermen don't get their bass in these areas because they don't know how to fish in, especially if they're casting. They don't get their baits in where the bass are, but with the minnow, why Donnie was able to get right down in those weeds. Well, how old do you suppose this bass is? Heist it up there. Donnie, oh, it's a heavy one. Well, how old about would it be? a bass this size is, uh, in, Mi in southern Michigan is probably somewhere up between, oh, tw it's hard to say, seven to ten years, somewhere in there, maybe average eight years. Now, if Donnie didn't catch it, what would happen to this bass? Chances are, with the stress of fishing and the age of this fish, no one would have caught it. It probably would have died of old age. Well, what happens when a, when a fish like this dies of old age? Sink to the bottom, uh, or if they float, but turtles consume them. They may, if, if they're in distress in the evening and would get in shallow water, a raccoon could get them or something like that. You mean while it's still alive? Still alive. Mm -hmm. Wow. Life is tough even for a big hog like this. Right. Well, Donnie, congratulations. Could you come down to Outdoor Rama on Master Angler Night? You think? It's going to be on Tuesday night, I think February 22nd. You want to come down and show the people of this state this fish on stage? <laughs> Terrific. We'll have him there. Great. Well, that's the largest bass of 1981 Master Angler Bass, eight and a half pounds. You know, you can find out all the things you want to know about legally catching fish, the seasons and so on, right here in the Michigan Fishing Guide. But there's a little box here that might be kind of distressing to you, it kind of bugs me, and I want to talk to you, Wayne Schmidt, about this. You're the staff ecologist for Michigan United Conservation Clubs. There's this little warning here, public health advisory. that says fish from certain locations contain, may contain hazardous levels of environmental contaminants. The Department of Public Health says this. They advise that uh, fish from some waters that pregnant women or even a woman uh, who is of childbearing age shouldn't eat these fish. We're talking about Great Lakes trout and salmon. What's the scoop? I mean, is it that serious, or this, is this just another saccharin and sugar and salt and cholesterol uh, falderol? No, it's an ugly fact of life that some of the fish from Michigan waters aren't safe to eat in any quantities. Others, uh, other species, should uh, consumption by sports anglers should be limited. Okay, let's, let's break this down one at a time. First of all, you have a map here where you can show us 
what type of contaminants are in what areas of Michigan? All of the Great Lakes waters have advisories on from the Michigan Department of Public Health for certain species and certain sizes. Fish, larger, older fish generally have the highest levels of contaminants. Fish that feed on the bottom, such as carp, would also have uh, higher levels of contaminants. Several uh, inland rivers and a few inland lakes also have fish eating uh, bans in effect where you're advised not to eat any fish from those waters. Okay, we're talking PCBs, DDT, Dieldrin, and even up here in the Upper Peninsula. Right. The Mercury is another contaminant, particularly in some of our uh, uh, waters like Lake St. Clair. And up here there's a lake called Deer Lake up by Ishpeming that's going to be added to the fishing advisory in this 1982 uh, digest in which uh, it's a very popular lake for uh, perch fishing particularly. And those fish are heavily laced with mercury and it's just been discovered. Wow, okay, this is, this is really rotten news, Wayne. Let's talk about the effects. I mean, seriously, I don't know of anybody, I haven't read of anybody who's died from overeating fish, PCB intake. Uh, the PCBs have been, uh, they're not manufacturing them anymore. Uh, DDT is banned, Dieldrin is banned. Right. Really, is it that big a worry? It is. It is. And, what what uh, evidence is there to say that people shouldn't eat the fish? All right, a lot of people will say, you know, I've been eating these fish all my life like mm. a maid. Nothing's happened to me. It's a big gamble right now. We really don't know. No one can tell you what the long-term effects of eating a lot of Great Lakes trout and salmon in particular Well, you particular can say that about be. anything, though. That's right. Do you, you have any look, evidence? You can look to the research that's been done by scientists uh, in animals in the effects that it has on uh, the natural system, effects on, on fish hatchability and fish like, survival in the wild. Like and what, though? We need some evidence, Wayne. Well, an example is rainbow trout fry. Uh, rainbow trout fry that are raised in, in waters can, or the, if the eggs uh, have about two, two and a half parts per million PCBs in them, the uh, hatchability and the survivability decreases dramatically, like uh, down about 75 percent. But we're if people. That's we're right. We're big mammals. That's right. let's, let's take a look at mammals. One, uh, I think a good example are uh, commercial mink farms. You would think that with all the surplus salmon, that would be a good source mm -hmm. of mink food for our uh, mink farms over on the western side of the state. They can't use them, though. Why because, not? Because uh, the mink fed those, those fish as a steady part of their diet, developed birth defects, they have stillbirths, a number of other abnormalities, and, and uh, it, it just uh, messes things up for them. So you mean the mink farmers in yeah. Michigan out of their choice will not use Great no, Lakes salmon? No, I, I think more, they get most of their fish from the Atlantic, but I'm not sure. But they don't use the salmon. Okay, well that is a, that's a piece of evidence that is kind of distressing there that we can see. But and if no you look at the literature, there's a whole, a whole range of evidence with other experimentation and other animals. Now, you, you, know, you can say that uh, humans aren't mink and humans aren't white rats and so on, but in a way we are. In a way, we're part of a grand experiment in this state right now, the sports anglers of this state. What will be those subtle, long-term effects. No one can answer that. Okay, well, since we don't have the absolute definitive answer to that, let's go over here, Wayne, and talk with Don Garling, the Extension Fisheries Specialist with Michigan State. Don, what can people do to take a fish from the Great Lakes that they choose to take the risk of, of eating, or they decide it's not a risk? What could they do to minimize any potential dangers? Well, first of all, if they clean the fish properly and take special precautions when they clean it, they can reduce the contaminants of um, uh, like PCBs and DDTs by as much as 35%. Uh, okay, like right here, you have a steelhead trout. Right. Caught by, uh, we'll give a little credit here to Jim Bedford, who caught it on a spinner. He'd like everybody to know that. Okay, Jim donated this fish for us to cut up, and you have filleted it. You want right. to flip that fillet back? All right. Where, where are the DDT, PCBs, and that in these fish? The, the um, organic chemicals, DDT and PCBs, are located in the fat deposits within the fish. Um, which are where? Which are generally along the dorsal portion of the fish and belly fat along the bottom part of the fish and underneath the skin. Okay, so, why don't you skin that out a little bit okay. right now so we can... One of the most important things that you want to have whenever you do this is a really sharp knife. And the only way you can do that is by continuing to use a steel or some yeah. other type of thing to keep it sharp. To skin a fish, you simply start at the tail end, insert the knife, and run it along the fillet. Okay, we're getting rid of the skin. Does the skin, Wayne, have any contaminants in it? The skin is a heavy source of contaminants, and if uh, fishermen do nothing else, that's one step that should be advi advised, is skinning those fish before they're cooked. So cut the belly fat off and skin mm -hmm. it. We've just 
cut the skin in half. You know what that's called? <laughs> it's called the pressure of television. I've done that before. Okay, but you wow. we're just doing it loosely here to show that you take the I've take left the, skin the, off. the belly fat mm -hmm. and much of the um, meat in that belly area on the skin. Piece so of that's skin. on the skin. We don't want that. Right. Now what's left? What about this dark meat okay, along this, the lateral line? This along the lateral line, this dark meat also should be removed. And you do that by simply cutting a V along the lateral line. Both sides. Both sides and lifting it out. Okay, and that is another source of the chemical contaminants. Exactly. Okay, now, uh, in the methods of cookery, we would assume would be ones you put it on a rack where it broils, right. it drips, takes any extra fat away. Broiling, charcoaling, uh, or baking on a rack is the best way because the fats will drip away from the meat into a pan where they can be discarded and won't be eaten. Okay, well, thank you, Don, very much. Those are tips on how to prepare. Let's get down to some business here, Wayne. Let me mention one other thing People about the cleaning, Fred. Yeah. You know, that, that, that will reduce the uh, levels of PCB and DDT, but mercury is one that's evenly distributed through the fish, so just be advised. Mercury that lakes you don't want to mess with. Well, that's right. That's okay. Right. This won't reduce the contaminants. Okay. People might not think, though, that uh, they may be willing to take the risk. Many, many people in this state are. What about you? Do, does this affect your attitude to learning about the mink farms and, and the difficulties there, or do you feel that this is like saccharin or some of these other a gloom and doom ecologists? I don't mean, you know, that's a bummer. I don't mean to sound that way, but someone's got to talk about it. And these are questions that anglers have to answer for themselves and their families. They can't assume that there's a government agency somewhere that's going to protect them from these kind of subtle long-term risks. Well, I think this is one thing, obviously, we haven't settled right here and we're going to have to talk about in the future, continue looking at some different angles on this. Let's take a look at some different angles here on some of uh, our viewers' attitudes. Uh, Ed, what have they written in about some of the issues we've put on the air? Well, uh, we're still getting uh, letters from the stanging issue and the hunting issue, uh, and they're important issues, so let's see what these viewers have to say. It's obvious that we do have a surplus of deer and need to harvest more of the herd especially in the Lower Peninsula. I would suggest a three-week gun season in the UP with the season starting a week earlier. I think a four-week season in the Lower would be a good answer with an any deer permit offered for $15 extra. Start the season November 8th. Okay, that was from William Calvert from Casapolis. A guy from Byron wrote, I'd phase in a week longer season for bucks and expand antlerless season in zone three another week to see what effect this had on the deer population. Experiment and do not jump into something headlong as the DNR and MUCC have been known to do. And on the issue of snagging, a viewer wrote about his experience with snagging at Tippy Dam. My wife and I could not believe all the snaggers we saw, men, women, kids. So we spent most of the afternoon walking and talking to the people. That night, I went to town and I bought all my gear. In those three years, I have never seen a fight, never seen a yelling match. Most people clean up after their trash. And the destruction of the land can't be put on the backs of the snaggers. We are there for a short period of time. We are not the only ones to use the river. Listen to this one, Ed, from employees of Cooper Industrial Products in Auburn, Indiana. We will not buy Michigan salmon stamps for the year 1982. Those fish don't bite on lures. I took one week's vacation and went to Allegan, Michigan and fished all week hard and did not even catch one fish. Everybody I talked to did the same and caught no fish. Now I ask the do-gooder, is it worth spending $150 to $200 on nothing? The people listed below are only from one factory, a few of the many, many people who said, Michigan, sit on it. Boy, they have some strong opinions That's there. That's a hot huh? one, Fred. It certainly is a hot issue. I hope uh, people write in with uh, your comments and attitudes. Let's go from a hot issue to something a little nippy or a little chilly. Remember Tip Up Town? I'm still shivering. Well, let's drift back a couple weeks and remember what it was like. I know I told you, Ed, that when we uh, got up to tip up town, you were going to be absolutely amazed at the thousands and thousands of people out on the ice. That's well, right, Fred, you did. There we are, Saturday afternoon, tip up town, Houghton Lake, uh, looked like a desert. Well, it may have be, been a little bit uh, weak in population, but not weak in spirit there. I tell you, everybody in spirits is uh, was <laughs> the story there. I tell you, the bars and taverns were crowded, but we went over to the Houghton Lake research station, the deer research station there at the Porter Ranch to find out if the ice fishermen aren't out and the snowmobilers aren't even out, what in the world are the deer doing at a time like this? Shivering, what? I guess. <laughs> they certainly were. So they have upwards of a hundred deer in pens there doing research on them and uh, we talked to John Nellist about what deer do in conditions like this. 
it not only looks cold, but believe me, it feels cold, and we can prove it. Well, John Nellis, you have your weather station here. What does it tell us about the conditions? Well, Fred, right now, the present temperature you can see here is a minus 8 degrees Fahrenheit. The warmest it got today was at 7.30 this morning, and the temperature was a plus 1. So at 2 o'clock, by 2 o'clock this afternoon, the temperature has dropped. Nine degrees to a minus eight. Oh, and no kidding. This wind is howling at about 20 or 30 miles an hour. It's cold, and the deer here have got to be feeling the effects too. Right. This, uh, however, isn't the most critical part of the year for them. They've come into the winter in fair shape, but uh, if this weather continues through the winter into late March, then we will have a high mortality if, in the deer herd. Which deer is it that are hit the hardest by the starvation and the exposure to the weather? Usually the younger deer, the uh, smaller ones, they're unable to get at food that the larger ones can, and quite often the larger ones will keep them away from what food is available. So like this deer here, well, young of the year, it's a small deer. How old would it be? This one here is about eight months old. And this is a typical deer that would uh, be hit by starvation in the spring? That's right. John, how do the deer keep warm in weather like this when the wind chill is 50 or 60 below zero? Well, Fred, uh, usually the deer in this type of weather are bedded down, and they are usually try to find an area with, with a windbreak, uh, cedar swamp, uh, jack pine stand, something similar to this, which uh, will also give them less snow to wade through also. Well, the hair on a deer doesn't look that long, but it must insulate them very well. Right. The hair in the winter months is a hollow hair, and uh, it gives real good insulation against the cold. Do they have any problem with a certain part of their bodies freezing up, like their ears or their eyelids or anything like that? Uh, we've never experienced anything like that. They, uh, use, they can stand this pretty well as long as they get into an area out of the wind. And The wind is the big problem for them. Right. John, do the bucks have an easier or a tougher time making it through conditions like this than the does? Uh, I don't think they have any advantage over the does, uh, and especially in uh, hard conditions. They're, they're going to they have the same mortality rate. Do they use their antlers at all for getting food, getting down to the, through the snow? No, uh, and usually at the end of January, 1st of February, they'll lose those, those antlers will drop off anyways, but they don't use them at all for digging for food at all. Well, this buck has a tremendous rack. Wow, a real trophy. How old is he? That one there, Fred, is about six and a half years old. His antlers are bleached out white. Why is that? Well, in the pen situation here, they don't have the young saplings and shrubs to uh, stain the uh, antlers the dark color that you see in uh, antlers in the wild. So this coloration is the, is the natural color of the antler then? Right, yeah. When will he lose his antlers? Those uh, antlers will drop usually in January or February. And will they come off one at a time over how long a period? Uh, yeah, usually they'll drop one at a time within a day or two of each other. John, where are these deer going to sleep on a night like this? Well, if they had a cedar swamp or jack pine stand, that's where they'd be sleeping. Unfortunately, they don't have that here. Now, a snow that is a couple feet deep like this is really good protection for them. Without the snow, they'd really be in bad shape, wouldn't yeah, they? Yeah, that's true. It, uh, it's added insulation. And what will they eat? What's their preferred food? Do they eat anything, anything different when the weather is so cold? Well, right this time of the year, they're unable to get at the grasses, and uh, they're going to be forced to eat uh, browse from uh, whatever they can get, uh, cedar, balsam, fir, whatever. If the weather breaks, at, at what point could the weather break and, you know, spring come that would let the deer off the hook from starvation? If we had a break about the middle of March, I think the deer would probably come out okay. We're going to lose a few, but I think it, but if it's hung on through the end of March, then we would lose a lot. It's kind of cold, isn't it, John? It sure is. It's about, let's see, these winds are blowing about 30, 40 miles an hour or 30 miles an hour, and the uh, temperature's eight below. You have low frost in your mustache. Yeah, I feel it. Aren't you glad we aren't deer? Yeah, I sure am. I'd hate to spend a night out in the woods tonight. I'm sure those deer were a lot warmer than the ice fishermen and snowmobilers were that weekend, Ned. Ned, we get questions of people writing in saying, uh, on a nice day in the winter, I'd like to go ice fishing. 
So aside from talking about what deer eat in the winter, what do fish like bluegill and the panfish eat in the winter? Very tiny baits. <laughs> okay, and that's why our ice fishing baits here, we have some little teardrop lures. Uh, these are the classic panfish ice fishing baits. Little teeny hooks, right. what about a number 10 or so? Right, 10 or 12 with assortment of colors. And you don't use them just by themselves, you put some bait on them. Usually you use a, a corn bar, a wiggler, or a little spike, some type of very tiny bait. Okay, and uh, let's work up the line here. The line, of course, is, uh, well, look at this, I got something already. Right here, try this one. <laughs> I'll try that one. Okay, I hooked on the rug there. We'll go up from there to a, um, a little sinker, a split right. shot. That's a little bit larger than I usually have, but on the other one I had small. Uh, and a tiny bobber. bobber right. Okay, and this, this is really all you need for ice fishing for bluegill or something like that. A rod, this rod is a fairly stiff one. It doesn't look like a factory type rod, uh, though. No, these, most of my rods are homemade. Uh, I've taken just the tip of a casting rod and stuck it in a handle. And uh, so it's very inexpensive to fix yourself up some uh, ice fishing gear. The other rod uh, was a tip of a fly rod, and it's very sensitive. It also, you notice, has a special little tip on the end of it so that you can tell when panfish are biting because they are very light biters and sometimes you, they'll barely move the bait at all. Well, this little piece of wire you can use on there is called a spring bobber or a right. sneaky bobber and that lets you know when the fish is nibbling. Right. Okay, this is what you would use. This is really all you need to go pan fishing for bluegill, something like that in our right. inland lakes. Right. Now, what about fishing out on Saginaw Bay? I have some film here of uh, fishing out on Saginaw Bay. You use different techniques. Of course, Saginaw Bay is the, the classic That's place. Very excellent place to catch perch. To catch, catch those little uh, yellow perch and use minnows for bait. Minnows are probably one of the best baits for perch and uh, about inch to an inch and a half long. They're very small uh, in size. And of course, you have to use a small hook in order to hook them because you don't want to kill the minnow. You want to get, uh, the, have the uh, minnow move around so that the perch are attracted. But this is the same basic type of rig. You can use a little teeny split shot to, to get it down there. Right, to the depth that you want it. If you find the perch, of course, you can sit right there and work on the school. Sometimes you have to work fairly hard to find them, which means that you do a lot of digging through deep ice with your either your ice spud or your ice auger. Now, some people would, would look at this and say, boy, that looks like a real blast. I wish I could put on a snowmobile suit and sit out in the snow <laughs> fishing through a little hole in the ice. How do you explain that, Ned? <laughs> Why is it so much fun? I think it's because perch are so good eating. Uh, they're a lot of fun to catch once you can get into them, but the reward is great because they are just excellent eating. Now, perch like this from Saginaw Bay, despite all the chemical warnings, they aren't a problem, are they? No, we don't have the problem with perch up there. So this is one species of fish that people can uh, catch and take and be confident, uh, in. Right, confident in eating. <laughs> well, that's the ye yellow perch fishing on Saginaw Bay. That's a lot of fun, uh, using the same type of gear. Now, so you have a couple other items here, which are really all you need for ice fishing. Why don't you describe them? Now, this is a, a handy little tool. Uh, I use it both for dipping minnows out of the bucket and also for skimming the uh, slush ice off of the, uh, the ice hole. And if you'll notice, it's a spring type of thing. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't freeze up. Some of the ice uh, uh, dippers that you use, they have holes they plug up. This one's easy because all you have to do is mm -hmm. hit it on something and it'll break the ice. Yeah, that's good. Out. You yeah. could probably make one like this. If right, you if you had the right size wire, right, and we're a little bit handy. Uh, the other important little tool to have that you need to purchase is, is a, uh, a little weight. You put mm -hmm. this on your hook, this on the hook, and you can test your depth so you know how deep to put your bobber. And where to set the bobber. Right. Now that's really all there is to ice fishing, and frankly, ice fishermen, according to the fishing surveys, are more successful per hour, aren't they? Yeah, right, they're very successful because they can get into the fish, the fish are not moving around, and they can get into schools and catch a lot of them. Yeah, well, that's a great way to do. You know, we've talked about a lot of fish here on this show, Ned. We talked about salmon and trout and bass. Yes. We, we talked about snagging. Let's wrap all of those together right now in our trophy report. <laughs> Saginaw outdoor cameraman and friend of mine, Pete Jonas, sent me some photos of four king salmon, which he and an Oregon friend caught in November on a river in southern Oregon. The largest, 35 pounds, caught on tadpoles with single hooks. Treble hooks, he wrote me, are illegal on Oregon rivers, and so is snagging. Pete says no one snags out there, and ethics and manners on the streams are very high. On this November day, about 30 other salmon he saw caught in the same area, and Pete and his friend caught and released 11 jacks that weighed three or four pounds each. A Michigan angler with western trophy taken with a western attitude towards salmon. Now 
here's an unusual trophy catch, an assortment of snagging hooks picked up off the bottom of a UP riverbed when a dam on the river was shut down for repairs. Lonnie Duquette from Nagane said he and his partners feel that snagging is unchecked and rampant in the UP, and they are against it. They don't like to find all these hooks on the bottom. They wrote, it doesn't take much of a fisherman to catch fish with these items, but it does take a good fisherman to catch them without them. But on the other side of the coin, the Arthur Standlick family from Brighton goes with two other families to the Manistee River each fall, and the seven children they take along all try their hand at snagging. In the past two years, Art's 10-year-old son was the only kid to catch a salmon. In his letter, he added, anyone who would tell my boy that he wasn't a sportsman is, fear of, is full of pure bull. I know he wouldn't believe it after all the hard work he did just to get one 20-pound fish. Well, we have quite a following south of our borders from people who watch Michigan Outdoors on the Bowling Green and South Bend public TV stations. Tony Reef from Bluffton, Indiana, sent us what he calls some Michigan magic, caught on opening day of our deer season in the St. Joe River. This 16 and a half pound steelhead caught on a tad poly will bring the Reef family back to Michigan this spring. And speaking of opening day of deer season, Bill Dingus from New Troy was fishing with a black plastic worm in Yellow Lake in southwestern Michigan on November 15th when he caught two massive angler-sized largemouths, one six, the other six pounds, 12 ounces. Well, for his two trophies on a day when most sportsmen were out deer hunting, let's make Bill Dingus, along with Donnie Anderson, our Master Anglers of the Week. 13th. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come back again right here on Michigan Outdoors next Thursday night. Funding for the preceding program was made possible in part by a grant from Farm Bureau Insurance Group and its agents throughout Michigan. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again, and all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. Sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan